Okay, please be seated. Okay, uh, Ms. Donald, then uh, you may continue. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Before we uh, broke, you talked about how you took photographs during your uh, SANE examination. Is that right? Yes. And I'm going to show you uh, Exhibit 174, it's a binder that I believe contains printed copies of those digital photographs that you looked at. If you could briefly page through uh, that binder and except for the first two pages where there's um, some blacked out section, do the pages, are they uh, true and accurate copies of the photographs that you took on March 22, 2018? Yes. Move Exhibit 174 into evidence. Any objection? No. Right. Exhibit 174 uh, will be received. I request to publish the photographs to the jury. All right. You may uh, publish the photographs to the jury. Just to clear up some confusion, wasn't the uh, CD actually also, I'm sorry, wasn't the CD actually also number 174? That's what my head of my notes, or the DVD. It might be. And yes, uh, the disc are, is 174. So maybe this could be 174B. Yeah. Okay, so the, this will be the binder of photographs then will be referred to as uh, Exhibit 174B. The disc is 174 in the electronic version. Now I can do it? Yes, mm -hmm. you may. to the first page of 174B. Uh, can you explain for the jury what this is a photograph of? This is a photograph of the patient's um, perineal area. Perineal. Do you have a spelling for that? Perineal. Perineal. Let me just look. You got it. Okay. Porter has it. Okay. <laughs> and is uh, this first page DOJ one one two seven depict the superficial lacerations that you described in your chart? Yes. And if you turn to the next page, Judge, I, I'm going to object to the, just the form of the question leading and ask her to ask what it depicts, as opposed. Sorry. I'm objecting to the form of the question as being leading for the future questions that they should be done as open-ended, asking what does this depict instead of does it depict. Okay, yeah. I'll sustain on the form of the question. Uh, turning to the next page, DOJ 1128, what does this photograph depict? This photograph is uh, just a different angle of the same shot um, of the patient's perineal area in the groin and her right thigh. And what if any injuries are depicted in this? Those are some superficial lacerations. Uh, turning to uh, DOJ 1129, what is depicted in this photograph? Those are the patient's hands and the right hand shows some abrasions and then the left hand Looks like it's dirty, but abrasions on the right hand. <coughs> and so when Both this dirty. photograph is taken and before the, ex or during the same exam, she is, the patient had not taken a shower. Is that right? Correct. She had not taken a shower. And so this is how she was presented to you when you examined her on March 22nd? Yes. Okay. Uh, turning to the next page, DOJ 1130, what is depicted in this photograph? 
those are the palm side of the patient's hands and the left hand has some lacerations, superficial lacerations on the palm side and the right hand appears to be dirty too. And then turning to DOJ 1131, what is depicted in this photograph? That I just used, a, it's the same, it's her hands, the palmer side of her hands, using a um, ruler to try and gauge the length of the lacerations. Okay. And then turning to the next page, a DOJ 1132, what is depicted in that picture? This is the patient's arm, her left forearm. And in that picture, it looks like there's an IV, um, like that would be in the antecubital area. And then some superficial lacerations um, with the word boy. And then a larger laceration on the top. Okay. And then turning to DOJ 1133, what is depicted in that photograph? This is the patient's uh, left arm again, just a different angle. It looks like upside down boy. The IV is still in place. And then I just used a ruler again to try and gauge the size of it. And during your examination, the patient told you that Alex had done these injuries to her arm? Correct. And turning to the next page, DOJ 1134, what, do you, uh, what does this photograph depict? That is the right thigh, and there's two um, superficial lacerations there, and then the other the lower part is the left thigh. And DOJ 1135, uh, same photograph with the ruler, is that right? Correct. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm not seeing a 1134 in my copy. Go. We go from 1133 to 1141, and then there's some loose pictures that begin with 1135. So. Are the other jurors missing 1134? There's two other books here. Mm -hmm. The record reflects that all jurors indicated that their binder was not received. 1134. Um, and then DOJ 1135, what is that photograph depict? That is the, the right thigh, again, with the ruler next to it to try and um, give you an idea how long it is. Okay. And if you flip that picture over, do you have GOJ 1136? Yes. What does that photograph depict? That is the outer portion of the patient's right thigh. And those are lacerations to the right thigh. And do you see some darker circular spots in the middle of those superficial lacerations? Yes. Um, do you remember what those were? That was an area of blood um, that looked like it came from a smaller one up higher. It was just dried blood. Okay. And uh, turning to DOJ 1137, what is that photograph depict? That is the same picture, a little bit closer with the um, ruler to give you an idea of how long it is. And then if you turn to DOJ 1138, what does that photograph depict? That is the right side of the patient's neck and like that mandibular, under the mandible area with a um, pink abrasion. And again, mandible is the jaw? Is that yes, right underneath that jaw. Um, and then turning to DOJ 1139, what is that photograph? That is, that's a picture of the patient. Um, we're always recommended to try and take a picture with her, um, with the patient's sticker just to verify 
that's who it is. Um, some previous witnesses described blood around the mouth, and do you know if the patient was cleaned before you uh, met with her? I didn't see any blood. I know that they had started to try and get her to clean up, but then they stopped um, knowing that someone was going to be coming in to do a SANE exam. And who are you referring to as they? Started? I'm sorry, the emergency department technicians and the primary nurse who were taking care of her. Okay, so before you arrived, they started to clean her body and then they were they stopped? Yes. Okay. Um, and then turning to DOJ 1140, what does that photograph depict? Just a different angle of her face, it looks like, with her holding up um, her patient sticker. And then uh, DOJ 1141, what is depicted in that for photograph? Sorry. This is the picture of the abrasion on her, the right side of her neck underneath the jaw and with the um, ruler. Okay, thank you. Um, did you only take photographs of any um, alleged injuries that you observed? Yes. Um, so if there's no photographs of the left leg, you didn't observe any injuries on that side? Correct. And if there was, wasn't any photographs of the right arm, you didn't observe any photographs there? Or excuse me, any uh, injuries there? Yes. Um, and the decision to do a SANE exam, uh, what was that based upon? Based on the patient's, um, when I spoke with the patient, that she had no recollection of what had happened for a couple hours, um, and her presenting to, um, I guess, a person's house full of blood. Um, when people have a lapse of memory, and they have unknown injuries, how they got them. Um, we're always trying to do what's best for the patient if they can't remember to try and collect evidence um, to give them a chance if their memory does come back or um, we find other injuries. But the SANE exam is done you know, only with consent of the patient to we can't just go in and collect evidence. Um, she was agreeable to that because she had not, um, she didn't have any recollection of what had happened to her. And were any tests performed to determine um, whether there was an actual loss of memory or just an unwillingness to communicate? Objection. It assumes facts, not in evidence, it's speculative. It implies something that's not true. All right. Well. I guess the question is, is there any tests? Are uh, there Judge, tests? also, I don't believe such a test even exists, so I... All right, well, I, I'm going to overrule your objection, then perhaps that would be the answer. Were there any um, tests that were performed uh, with respect to the patient uh, claiming lack of memory? No. Um, and how long were you with the uh, defendant on March 22nd? I was with, I got there around 7, and I was there to about 11. So approximately four hours you were with her? Correct. Uh, no further questions. All right, then, uh, uh, Ms. Nolan, were you going to answer questions about the, again, what the redaction on DOJ 1127, 1128? Um, yes, Ms. Morris, I... You were originally reviewed photographs of the first two pages of Exhibit 174B. Do you remember that? Yes. And you reviewed them without redaction, is that right? Yes. Um, due to the redaction, are any injuries or marks being covered up as a result of that redaction based on your memory? No. Okay, okay thank you. Yes. Okay, cross-examination. One minute, please. 
uh, Ms. Morris, um, before you examined Ezra McCandless, she was in the custody of law enforcement officers. That's what you said, right? I don't know if she was in custody, but law enforcement was present in the emergency department. Right, and custody would apply she was under arrest. She wasn't under arrest. No, she wasn't. But they were seated with her. They were in the emergency department. When I went into room eight, the room she was in, there was no law enforcement in the room. It was an emergency department technician sitting with her, and law enforcement was outside in the hall. Okay. Did, were you aware that law enforcement had brought her into the hospital? The report that I had been given was that she came in by emergency medical services by ambulance. And were you aware that there had been either law enforcement officers or emergency medical technicians or nurses or other hospital personnel with her constantly from the time she had come in to the hospital until the time of your examination? Objection, speculative. I asked if she was aware she can answer yes or no. I'm gonna overrule. Go ahead, you may answer. Yes, I was aware that there were people with her. Okay, the law enforcement people that you saw there, they were all male, correct? Objection, relevance. I'm gonna overrule, go ahead, you can answer. If I remember correctly, yes. Um, but there were also women uh, hospital personnel who had been with Miss Miss Camless, for example, when she went to remove her clothing and put on a hospital gown. She would be accompanied by a female, not a male, of course, from the hospital. Yes. Okay. And she also had seen a nurse, a female nurse, before you conducted your examination. Correct. Now, when you examined her, you asked her if she had used any alcohol or drugs, correct? Yes. She told you she had not? Yes. She reported a high level of pain to you. She reported being sore in her bottom. Correct. Yes. And specifically pain associated with the lacerations that were near the vaginal area, right? Yes. Um, but she did not want pain medications. She did not ask me for pain medication. Okay, and of course you've seen people who are drug addicts come into a hospital and ask for narcotics because they're trying to get Objection. drugs. relevance? Well, I don't know what the relevance is, but... Uh, I think it'll be clear with the next question. Okay, I'm going to overrule the objection. You, you've seen that happen in your job as a nurse, right? Yes. And, you know, people trying to manipulate people by trying to get drugs, right? Yes. But she didn't do that. In fact, the opposite occurred. She reported pain but declined pain medication to the best of your knowledge. Yes. Okay. Now, um, you also said you collected blood to see if there would be, um, uh, that that can assist to see um, whether or not a, a drug has been given involuntarily to a person, correct? Yes. And you're aware that once the blood is in the vial, it can be tested for voluntary or involuntary substances. Yes. And certainly the crime, you know the crime lab has the capacity to do that. Yes. Um, now, when she talked to you about the pains and cuts that were near her vaginal area, it's fair for us to say this is a really sensitive area of the body. Yes. And it's not surprising that this would be reported by a patient as being painful. Yes. And even what you call a superficial laceration, simply because it didn't go deeper, doesn't mean that it wouldn't hit the nerve endings on the skin and be very painful to somebody in Correct. that sensitive area, right? Um, I'm going to show you um, some pictures now. Uh, let me just show them to the state first. All right, I'm going to um, now show you some exhibits, and we're going to put them on the screen, Madam Clerk. Um, so we're going to start with number 635. This has been, these are part of what was previously marked as exhibit number 174, the CD. These are all photos from the hospital and 174B. Um, some of these photographs are in 174B and some of them aren't, but they're similar. Um, so the picture I'm showing you is marked here as exhibit number 635. And that is a picture of the side of Miss McCandless's 
uh, to the right side of her neck, correct? Yes. And that picture that we're seeing up there, that red mark that you see, um, that's the red mark you're talking about when you said it was below the mandibular, or in other words, the jawline, right? Yeah. Yes. And that's not a thin line, it's much thicker, correct? Correct. Now, you've had a number of different patients who've come in at different times, uh, sexual assault patients you've examined who have advised you that an assailant um, attempted to strangle them, or they, they frequently use the word choke, even though that's not really technically correct, right? Correct. I mean, choking is something that happens on the inside of your throat. But many times when that happens, when some, a patient reports that, there's no mark necessarily left. Correct? Correct. Okay. But in this case, we have a pretty clear, distinct red mark. Right? Yes. And that's why you took a picture of it. Yes. All right. So even though the patient can't tell you something that happens, that's an important piece of evidence, isn't it? Yes. All right. I'm going to next move on to what's been marked as exhibit number 636. And Judge, uh, this is also from exhibit 174, the CD. And this is uh, the picture you previously talked about that shows uh, her holding up her name, and that's for identification purposes, right? Yes. Just kind of like hospital bracelets are for right. identification purposes. And looking at this picture, if you look at her lip on um, what appears to be our left but would be her right side, you can see a cut, a small cut or laceration to the uh, end of her lip on the right side, correct? Yes. And there appears to be another laceration um, to the right of that, uh, which would be to her left, also uh, like a what you might call a superficial laceration, correct? Are you talking on the lip? Yes, right. on the lip. It does, yes. Okay. There's also a small area, which is kind of dark colored. I don't know how to use this thing. Um, here. I'm terrible at these things. I'm going to ask Mr. Nelson to help me. There's a little mark right there that looks like a small scab as well, correct? Yes. And you can also, on the bottom side of her chin, very close to the paper, it's, it's a little hard to see, but you can see a red line there as well, correct? Yes. All right. So fair to say that, you know, these could have been bleeding earlier and been cleaned up by the time you actually saw Ms. McCandless. Yes. Okay. I'm next going to show you what's been marked as exhibit number 637. This is a close-up of what you previously described as the marks to her leg. And this is particularly to her right leg, correct? Yes. And there's an area that you described as dried blood? Yes. Was it dried by the time you saw it? Yes, it was. Okay, so if these were noted by uh, somebody as puncture wounds, that would be consistent with puncture wounds, correct? Yes. Okay. And there is seems to be some other discoloration on the leg there as well, um, in the area of the top scratches. I do see that. It looks like it could be blood, but I'm not sure. I didn't chart. I guess okay. I, because that wouldn't necessarily be something you would chart, right? If I saw it and it was pretty obvious, I, I should chart it. Well, I mean, small mistakes happen, right? Blown up photography can sometimes show you more than you're going to see with the naked eye. Correct. Okay, so it's, all right. So number 638, I'm going to go to that picture next. Um, and looking at picture 638, this is a picture of the palms of her hands, right? Yes. And looking at the palms of her hands, you specifically noted the lacerations, which were to her left hand. Yes. It's fair to say that both of the hands show quite a bit of redness as well? Yes. And those could be, are consistent with perhaps falling on a hard surface like a road or gravel? Yes, but it could be, but I don't... You don't know? No, exactly. Okay. I don't know. But you notice there's definite redness there? Correct. Um, now... You were not shown pictures of Miss McCandless's clothing, right? I was not. You, and you never saw the clothing because before you got there, it was marked in bags, 
Yes. So if the clothing corresponded to certain injuries that might cause you to look for other things, you were you really didn't have an opportunity to see those things, right? Yes, I did not see the clothes. Okay, picture 619, please. Um, I'm showing you what's been marked as exhibit number 619, which has previously been introduced in evidence. This is a gold sweater, and you can see that it's cut all the way through on the front of the sweater. Yes, I see oh, that. Okay, but you never saw that before your examination? No. And I'm going to show you what has been marked as picture number six, uh, exhibit number, excuse me, 640. And this is a, uh, I guess, a blue and white button-up shirt. Is it fair to say that? Blue or grayish? It's a little hard to see the color. Yes. And you can see that that shirt on this photograph has been cut in, in the uh, center area. Yes. Of the shirt, right? And there appears to be what could be, and I'm not saying you should say it should be, but like mud or blood on the shirt. Yes. And you never saw that either? I did not see that. And now I'm going to show you what's been marked as exhibit number 639. And uh, fair to say that's a t-shirt? Yes. And that was also an item of clothing you had not been shown? Yes, I had not been shown that. And, and that item of clothing on the t-shirt uh, under the tiger, there's a kind of a reddish mark, which could be blood, but you don't know, right? Right. I don't Do know that. Also see the little area that's circled? Oh, yep, I see that. Okay. And if, if it's going to help you, I'm going to just show you the actual picture because it's pretty hard to see on the screen. And the area that's circled, actually it's much easier to see here than where I was. The area that's circled appears to be a defect to the material or a small cut into the fabric, right? Yes. But you weren't aware of that either? No, I was not. So finally, I'm going to show you what has been marked as uh, exhibit number 641. And um, this is a picture of Ms. McCandless's abdomen. Do you see a small scratch on her abdomen? Yes, I do. And that appears to be in the same position, or it's close by where the defect was to the fabric on the previous picture of the t-shirt, right? Yeah, that could be. Okay. And... You um, did not note that in your report? No, I did not. Okay, that's pretty small, right? Yes. Fair to say, if you had been aware that there had been a cut to the t-shirt, you might have noticed that as well, even though you did not. Objection, speculative. Overruled. Do you can answer. Yes, I might have looked a little harder, but I know I visualize, you know, with her consent and with being appropriate, the whole body, you know, we're constantly looking for injuries. Sure. And I'm, I'm not trying to be critical or anything. Sure. It's just, it's very small. And that's something that can be easily overlooked if you don't have information about the potential for some kind of small scratch there. Right. I mean, that's not a laceration like the other things. It hasn't necessarily been cut into. It's more of a scratch, mm -hmm. right? Correct. So just like you didn't particularly note scratches on the lip, but they were there, it, 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 it's like that, th that you didn't note the small scratch to the abdomen. Yes, I did not note that. Okay, thanks. Um, now, when... When Ms. McCandless spoke with you about what occurred, you've already recited that she um, said she was sitting in her car with Alex. She didn't remember, right? She, yes. She didn't know if she'd been sexually assaulted, but she was guessing as to whether or not she had been. I don't recall her ever guessing. I... She, she just didn't give me much information, and I tried to get more information, but 
Well, in your report, you noted that when asked if sexually assaulted, she said both, I don't know, and also, I guess I was raped at Hertz. Yes. So that was guesswork on her Exactly, yeah. And um, she couldn't give you any description, but she said she'd been with Alex the last she remembered. Before that, she'd been with Jason, right? Correct. And she said she'd been at Owen Park with Jason, and then he left and she was hanging out with Alex. She told you that? Yes. But she didn't give you specific details about whether she was in fact at Owen Park with Alex or not. That wasn't something she said. She just said she'd been there with Jason and then later she was with Alex. Yes. So her inability, um, and of course she could not recall how she got to a farmer's house covered in mud. Yes. Right. Now, you have specific questions you ask when a patient comes in for a SANE exam that are done in an effort to help the person recall, right? Yes. And I think you said when the person doesn't recall, their job is to follow up. Your job. I'm sorry, not their job. <laughs> Your job is to follow up. Yes. And this is something you've been specifically trained on, correct? Yes. I see that you've gone to a number of different trainings to become a SANE nurse. And it's because the training has to be specialized as compared to other particular jobs that an RN may do in a hospital setting. Correct. And the, one of the things that you have learned is that it's not uncommon for sexual assault victims to not recall what's happened. Correct, yes. And it's very common for them not to remember the order in which things have happened. Yes, it, it and is. it's very common for them to not recall, but later be able to reconstruct their memory a couple of days later. Right. And that is not an unusual response to trauma. Correct, it's not. And you would agree with me that different people handle trauma differently. Yes. Right? It all just depends on who the person and the patient is. Yes. And you give them the same care and consideration regardless of whether they can call or not recall, recall or not recall what specifically happened. Yes. You're going to give them the exact same treatment, the exact same examination, because people do recall things later, right? Yes. And just because somebody doesn't recall something doesn't mean they're not a victim of an attack. Correct. Now, when you examined... Uh, Ms. McCandless, Dr. Tillotson was in the room at the outset of the examination? Yes, he was in when I did the, the um, vaginal area and the peri area because we, um, some of the doctors want to be in there to make sure there's no um, trauma, bleeding, um, and he is one that always wants to be in there when we're doing the actual pelvic speculum exam. Okay, so he wants to be in there, and he is there in his capacity as an emergency room physician yes. for an internal examination. Yes. Um, and But he didn't stay in the room the entire time. No. He was just there for a rather brief period of time? Yes. I mean, a typical pelvic takes, what, 10 minutes at the most? At the most, yes. Okay. Fair to say that that is not the most pleasant part of a SANE exam? It would probably be the worst part of it. Yes. And also looking at the anus as well would be an uncomfortable part for a patient. For the patient, yes, definitely. Yes, yes. and when, I, when we said the worst part of exam, by the way. I meant for the patient. I, yeah, I meant the patient too. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so we're on the same page there. Now, um, were you aware of her giving any pres being given any prescribed medication in the hospital? The report that I had received was she had the IV in place and that she had been given Zofran for nausea, but that was before I got there. Okay, so that's the only medication you were aware of that she had received prior to um, your examination. Yes. And is it typical that medications, other medications, may be given after a SANE examination? Yes. And that's because uh, that medication can eventually end up in the blood, and one might not know where the medication came from when a toxicology exam is done later, whether it was given, a medication was given <laughs> at the hospital or prior to coming to the hospital. That's a possibility, right? Yes. Hopefully they've charted the medication they've given, too, so we have it on record. Of course. Right. Of course. Um, now, um, 
Now you, but what you do know is there was an IV inserted into her and that she'd been given this one anti-nausea medication. Yes. And it's fair to say that Zofran is very effective as a medication to prevent nausea and vomiting in a patient. Yes. And that's why it's given, and, and it's particularly effective if you give it intravenously. Yes. So you don't have to wait until it goes from the uh, get GI or gastrointestinal system into the bloodstream that way. Yes. Now, while Ms. McCandless did not remember what occurred to her, it's fair to say she was cooperative with the examination. Yes, she was. She gave you consent to, ev to do everything, which was her choice, right? Yes. She signed medical releases so law enforcement could get all of her medical records, right? Yes. And that was her choice. Yes. You certainly didn't pressure her into that. No. And she also consented to having all these photographs taken, right? Yes. Including to sensitive and personal areas, private areas of her body, right? Yes. And you didn't pressure her into that either. No. So she was cooperative to the extent that she was able to be during the examination. Yes. I don't have any further questions. Can you redirect? Yes. Um, Ms. Morris, when you had asked uh, the patient if she had been strangled, what was her response? Unknown. And did you uh, examine her, the patient's eyes? Yes. And what do you look for for strangulation when you look at a patient's eyes? We look for um, bleeding, their little petechial hemorrhages in the eyes, so the whites of the eyes would become red and bloodshot. And did you notice any um, petechiae in her eyes? No. Uh, and also, when you look at um, the neck for potential strangulation, do you look at uh, bilateral both sides of the neck? Yes. And did you notice any red marks on the left side of the neck? No. Did you notice any finger marks or hand imprints? I did not. Um, all of the, uh, I guess, injuries uh, you examined on uh, the defendant, did you need to bandage any of them? I did not. All the bleeding was controlled. Um, did, were any stitches needed or glue? N not that I am aware of. I, when I was there, we didn't do any stitches or glue. You were shown a picture of um, the right outer thigh that had some linear lacerations. Do you recall that picture? Do you yes. Want me to... No, that's all right. Um, and you were asked whether those were puncture wounds or dried blood. Remember that? Yes. What did you believe that to be when you examined her? When I was looking at it, it appeared to be dried blood. Sure. And you were asked um, a number of questions about, let me go back to, you were asked, you were shown a, a picture of a small scratch on the, I guess, abdomen area. Is that right? Yes. Do you know when that photograph was taken? I don't. It didn't look like I took it. It didn't have the same sure. ruler. And as far as you recall, when you examined the patient's body on March 22nd, 2018, do you recall observing that little scratch? I do not. And um, you were asked that you arrived around 7.20, is that right? Yes. Um, and would it have been possible for the defendant to be alone at any time before you arrived? It could have been possible I wasn't there, so I can't definitely answer that question if she was alone in the room at all. Um, and you were asked some questions about clothes that may have been the defendant's? Yes. Um, do you know how those clothes got torn? I do not. So it's possible for a person to cut those clothes themselves? It is possible, yes. And it's, but it's also possible for someone else to cut them? Yes. You just don't know? I don't know. And that's not your job? No. What was your job? To um, help the patient navigate through this process and collect evidence, um, determine if there were any injuries. Okay. I have no further questions. Any recross? Yeah, I have a little bit. 
Um, you were asked right away about strangulation. Now, we all agree that strangulation doesn't necessarily leave marks, right? Yes. Okay. And just as it doesn't necessarily leave marks, strangulation doesn't always cause uh, petechiae, and I think I should probably spell that, P-E-T-A-C-H-A-I-E. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, it, it doesn't always call petechiae in the eyes, correct? I, I'm not an expert at what the ones that I have seen have caused petechiae. Okay. So you're not an expert, but have you ever been advised that it may or may not it yes. depend on the amount of force that would be used, correct? That's been in your training. Correct. So what you've seen, let, let me just say this, if, if you think this is fair. When you go to training, you have the accumulated knowledge over a large body of patients who you will never see that many patients in your life, right? Correct. And so the person who does the training has accumulated all this data and all this knowledge about stuff, and they're passing the information on to you so you're aware of it. Yes. And what you personally see in your practice is a much smaller subset of what occurs. Right? Yes. So when you've been taught that there's not necessarily, when you've been taught at a training, excuse me, that there's not necessarily petechiae, that comes from that w much wider body of knowledge of people who have studied many more patients than obviously you're ever going to get the chance to do. Right? Yes. Okay. So you would have no reason to disagree with what you've been taught in your training. Fair? Correct. Yes, that's fair. All right, now you also know strangulation is actually kind of what's called a form of asphyxia, correct? Yes. And that can cause, while it's happening, problems for the patient um, in terms of more than just leaving a red mark on somebody's neck, fair to say? That's fair to say, yes. And that can include potentially um, uh, uh, inability to breathe? Yes. Hyperventilation? Right? Yes. It can include um, vision changes while it's going on, such as blurred vision. Yes. It can include um, what one might call tunneling or, uh, you know, one doesn't like see peripherally while it's going on. Yes. That's fair to say, right? It can cause dizziness. Yes. It can cause memory loss short term. Yes. And long term as well for some people, right? Yes. And it can cause lightheadedness, right? Yes. Because when that's happening, basically what's going on is there's a lack of oxygen to the brain. Correct. Okay. And that's what causes all of these symptoms that we're talking about. Yes. I don't have anything further. Okay. Um, you may step down. And uh, is Ms. Morris? Yes. Um, you Judge. I'm sorry, I neglected to move in the following exhibits into evidence. 638, 637, 635, 636, 619 I think was already in evidence, but I'm also offering 639, 640, and 641, which are all gonna come in at a later time, so I was thinking we might as well just move them in now. They may be in in a different format. Any objection from the state? There may be some duplication, but it's referred to in this exam or this examination as those numbers. So, the only objection is to that last photograph that I don't believe there's a proper foundation for. <clears throat> okay, that would well, be 641. 641. Well, I will receive 635, 636, 637, 638, 619, 640 and 639 and I'll just uh, we'll just reserve ruling on 641 I assume there will be additional testimony regarding 641 at a later time but I won't receive that at this time thank you all right and is Miss Morris uh, free to go yes okay thank you Miss Morris have a good day Ms. Suartos, can you state and spell your first and last name for the court reporter, please? Kelly Suartos, K-E-L-L-Y-S-W-A-R-T-O-S. You know, Ms. Suartos, where do you work? I work at Mayo Clinic Health Systems in Eau Claire. 
How long have you been there? Two years. What's your title? I'm a social worker. Um, have you been a social worker anywhere else prior to that? Prior to that, I was a hospice social worker at a local hospice agency. Um, may I approach? You may. I'm going to show you what's marked as Exhibit 184. Do you recognize what that is? I do. What is that? My resume. Um, and is CV. That, I'm sorry, go ahead. My CV. Is that a reasonably up-to-date or completely up-to-date, uh, accurate copy of your resume? It is. Okay. And that includes some of the additional locations where you were a social worker, correct? Correct. All right. Um, were you working March 23rd, 2018? I was. Did you have an opportunity to treat Ezra McCandless? I did. Um, and the purpose of that was to do a, a, an initial assessment, correct? Correct. And that was at Mayo Hospital? Correct. Is part of that making sure that um, a patient in general, or in this case, Ms. McCandless, is comfortable? Yes. Okay. Did, Ms., did the, the patient that day provide you information about uh, actually the day before? So March 22nd, 2018? Not to my recollection. Did she provide you information about what led her to being at the hospital? Yes. Okay. Um, did she tell you where she started the day that led her to the hospital? She reported to me that she started the day at her dad's house. Did she tell you where she ended up? She reported that she ended up in a farmer's, on a farmer's property. Did she tell you how she got there? She indicated that she had driven. Um, it was did, implied, can I correct myself? Sure. She, it was implied that she had driven there. And what do you mean by it was implied? Because one of the questions I had asked her was where her vehicle was at the time we were speaking and she didn't know. So she told you she didn't remember where her car was or didn't know where her car was? That's correct. Did she tell you what she told the homeowner um, at the farm where she ended up? She told him that she was raped. That's what she told you that she told him? That's correct. Did you ask her if she, if she or did she tell you what happened between the time that she implied that you assumed that she drove there and when she ended up at the farmer's house? Did she tell you what happened in that meantime? I don't recall. Did you, did she acknowledge past self-harm? She did. Did you specifically talk with her about um, injuries specific to the time that she was in the hospital? Injuries that she currently had at that time? She reported to us that the, the injuries that she had, that were, the current injuries were from a recent sexual assault. And let me, when you say recent, does that mean right before she entered the hospital? Yes. Okay. Um, specifically, let's talk about, she had injuries on her thighs, is that correct? That is correct. Um, and did she tell you who made those injuries, who was responsible for those injuries? That would be the person who she told us attacked her. Did she have injuries on her, her left arm? on one of her arms, if you don't know specifically? Yes. And did she tell you the same thing? It was the person who attacked her? Yes. Uh, did she ever tell you that she self-inflicted those injuries either to her thighs or to her arm? No. Nothing further. Thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Bishney. Um, Ms. Swartos, When you did your assessment, when you did an assessment of Ms. McCandless, you ended up having some uh, 
some kind of electronic medical record or report that was created? Correct. And that information that got typed into that record, is, is this something that you typed yourself? It is. All right, I guess I'll get this marked. And I just want to make sure that this is yours. One minute, I'm, the clerk is giving me the exhibit number. It starts with DOJ 941. Through what page? Um, I think the report itself goes, one second, I'll come over there. Mark as exhibit number 644 and make sure that that's the report that you uh, generated, the electronic medical record. Okay. Is that accurate? It is. So, one of the things that you noted in the report was that Ms. McCandless was very easily tearful. Yes. And was she tearful when she talked to you? She was. Okay. Now, the other thing um, that she said to you, um, it, well, let me just ask this. What you just testified, there's a section of your report, and I can show it to you if you need me to refresh your memory. <coughs> it's called impressions, right? Mm -hmm. And the, you have to say yes for the yes. report. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so when, in the section that you call impression, that's your memory of what she told you, right? Correct. So it doesn't mean it's a word-for-word -word transcription of what Ms. McCandless said? That's correct. And are you sitting at a computer typing while you're talking to her, or are you interacting with her and typing this up later? I'm interacting with her and typing that right. up later. Right. Not very friendly to be sitting staring at a computer screen while talking to a patient, right? Correct. And in fact, fair to say that's kind of a common complaint about going to the doctor these days is they're more involved with their computer screen than with you as a person, right? Correct. So that thing that that people sometimes do of looking at a computer screen is not the way you would interact with another human being in your job as a licensed and trained social worker. Correct. You want to make the person feel comfortable with you, right? I do. I do. But nonetheless, you're not able to then go, because you're not taking notes contemporaneously, you're not able to go and put in your computer exactly word for word what the patient said, right? That is true. So when you say that the person who attacked her, injured her, that doesn't necessarily mean that she used the word rape with you at all, right? Correct. You can't say that. But she did, right? You can't say that she used it. I can't say today that she used the word rape that day. Okay. But you do know that she definitely said she had been attacked by somebody. That is true. That you're sure about, right? She also um, talked to you, um, it, I mean, she told you she had a loss of memory, right? She did. And, um, but at this particular juncture, were you aware that there were more details she was remembering than what she had said the day before in the emergency room, or you just didn't know anything about that? I didn't know very much about that at that time. And these injuries to her legs that you're talking about, you didn't, like, have her disrobe and examine them, did you? I did not. That's not your job. You're not a doctor. It, that's correct. And, and that's the medical people take care of that. That's not what you're supposed to do, right? That's correct. You are a social worker, right? I am. So you've learned about trauma, certainly. Yes. And in your job, as you've learned about trauma, you learned that different people respond to trauma differently. True. And that some people, in fact, have amnesia with trauma, right? Yes. And there's even different kinds of amnesia that people get. Some is permanent, some is temporary. Is that right? That's true. And, and often people who've been through trauma and have had amnesia or have had a certain response to trauma do recover their memories later. Right? Yes. yes. Have you gone to advanced training about that? Not in particularly, no. Okay. So you didn't go to the training um, in Wisconsin that was done by a Dr. Hopper from out east, did I you? I did not. And um, you're also aware that sometimes people who've had trauma don't necessarily want to talk about it, right? Correct. And it can be kind of difficult for people like that when they're in the hospital, they're being asked lots of questions by lots of people, right? Correct. Um, a teaching hospital? It is not. 
Okay, so at least you don't have to talk to the medical students coming in, right? True. But there's interns and residents who sometimes come through with doctors, right? Sometimes. There's nurses, correct? Yes. There's medical technicians. Yes. There's physician's assistants. Yes. There's all kinds of people talking to you when you're in the hospital, right? Yes. And also when you're in the hospital, a lot of times people wake you up in the middle of the night to take your vital signs. Right? They do. And although this is all good and necessary from the medical point of view, in fact, when you're a patient, it can seem very intrusive. Yes. Right? So even though I'm sure you were really nice um, in all of your dealings, from the point of view of the patient, sometimes the question could be they may feel that it's intrusive. And that's Objection a calls feeling. for speculation. Sustained. Okay. So in any event, um, you do know that it's not uncommon for patients um, who you talk to not want to always tell you everything, right? Yes. And many people will decide, look, I'm just not ready to talk about this, and they're not going to tell you, right? Correct. Now, one of the things that Ms. McCandless did tell you was that she had some uh, history of post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Yes. She told you she'd gone to a counselor for post-traumatic stress disorder. That's correct. And she said this all came about when she was much younger after being in a serious car accident where a, a, a horse bolted it from an Amish buggy and flew through the window of her car, right? That's correct. And although luckily she wasn't seriously physically injured, emotionally that left her with certain scars. Correct. And she had had uh, post-traumatic stress disorder as a result, right? That's what she reported. Right. And she also... Um, told you that those memories can make her anxious when she's driving. Correct. She said also that she was involved in something in February where she overdrank at a friend's house. That's right? correct. And when she drank to excess, she told you that she had actually um, um, woken up and uh, was in the middle of sexual intercourse, right? That's correct. Now, you know sometimes when people use alcohol, they also have blackouts, right? I do know that, yes. And they can appear to be completely conscious to another person and but have no memory of what's going on, right? Correct. So even in sexual assault cases, sometimes that person can be, appear to be conscious and consenting but not have any memory and later wake up and think that something happened to them that shouldn't have. Correct. Right. Now, she's not the one who used the word post-traumatic stress disorder. That's your word in the report, isn't it? I can't. I don't recall if she used the word. I did. I know I did chart that the term PTSD. Because that's a diagnostic term. It is. And so being a diagnostic term for you, that's basically a term of art, so to speak, or a scientific term. Correct. Okay. At which the common ordinary person may not know that term right correct and I guess just to be clear so everybody understands that means post-traumatic stress disorder correct okay um, I don't have anything further can you redirect uh, briefly at first I think I failed to move in exhibit 184 I do that now if I did fail to do that no objection all right, 184 will be received. Um, you have some tra training in trauma, correct? I do. Does that cause people to lie? It does not. You said that the word raped may not have been what was specifically said to you. Um, did, the de did the defendant tell you that the attack was sexual? Yes. Now, there was some question about people being woken up in the middle of the night and poked and prodded. Your interview didn't happen in the middle of the night, did it? It did not. Okay. Nothing further. Any recross? No, I don't have anything. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wardos. You may step down.